My name is Julia Croce and I'm representing the McGill Journal of Sustainable Development Law. We are excited to share with you a recorded webinar with Dr. Alexandra Harrington that we hosted this past October on the topic of just transitions in climate change law. Stay tuned for more upcoming presentations and be sure to follow us on Facebook at McGill Journal of Sustainable Development Law for future presentations and webinars, as well as look at past recordings on this YouTube channel if you wish. Thank you and enjoy. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to give a little intro to the journal before we start and an intro to the speaker and then a little intro to the topic as well. And then um, we shall hear what um, Harrington has prepared for us. So I'm excited. So the journal, a little bit about the journal, uh, the McGill Journal of Sustainable Development Law provides a forum in which the world's leading scholars exchange ideas on the intersection between law, development, the environment, economics, and society. Au cours du dernier quart de siècle, il est devenu impératif de déterminer comment enrichir notre monde de manière plus durable, notamment en raison de l'impact du développement sur l'environnement et les droits de l'homme. Malgré ce besoin pressant d'idées nouvelles, Il existe peu de débouchés pour des commentaires éclairés et ciblés sur la durabilité, en particulier au Canada. So in response to this void in 2004, students established the MJSDL, a peer-reviewed academic journal. And you can actually find um, Harrington's article in our latest volume, uh, volume 15. So go check that out. So a little bit about um, our invited guests today. So Dr. Alandra, so, sorry, Dr. Alexandra R. Harrington is the founder and director, uh, executive director of the Center for Global Governance and Emerging Law and Research Director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. She has served as Ful uh, Fulbright Canada Special Foundation Fellow uh, at the Balzilli School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Canada, and was the 2018-2019 uh, Fulbright Canada Research Chair in Global Governance based at the Balzilli School of International Affairs. She holds a doctoral degree in law from none other than the McGill University Faculty of Law. <laughs> and Dr. Harrington is the author of International Organizations and the Law from 2018, International Law and Global Governance, Treaty Regimes and Sustainable Development Goals Interpretation from last year and the forthcoming Just Transitions and the Future of Law and Regulation, which, uh, as I said, is forthcoming. So she serves as the Director of Studies for the International Law Association Colombian Branch, a member of the International Law Association Committee on the Role of International Law in Sustainable and Natural Natural Resource Management for Development, a member of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative Scientific Committee, and a member of the Green Economics Institute's research group. She also guest lectures globally on topics related to international law, environmental law, global governance, sustainable development, and is an international advisor to various faculties, including the University of Silesia Faculty of Law. Dr. Harrington has served as a consultant for entities such as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Commission uh, for Environmental Cooperation of the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation, uh, UNEP, and IDLO. And Dr. Harrington's nearly 100 publications address a variety of fields relating to international law, including international organizations, governance issues, environmental law, legal issues uh, relating to climate change, international child's rights, natural resources, regulations, um, international human rights law, international trade law, corporate responsibility, and criminal law. And so, like I mentioned, she likes to uh, guest lecture and she's joined us today to talk about uh, the following topic. So, l'idée the transition just to evolve de façon spectaculaire 
passant d'une réponse largement basée aux États-Unis aux efforts de fermeture des mines de charbon et des communautés associées dans les années uh, 1990. Uh, uh, un concept reconnu au niveau mondial à, avec le potentiel dédié à atténuer les impacts économiques des réponses aux changements climatiques. So, indeed, the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the 2018 Katowice Rulebook, uh, which operationalize it, include just transitions as key elements in international legal and policy responses to climate change. Uh, and yet, as significant as the rise of just transitions has been, analyzing it outside of the labor and extractive industries offers the potential for even greater growth, particularly in light of the challenges faced um, by the sectors from tourism to transportation and beyond in light of the recent pandemic. So this presentation will discuss uh, the growth and development of just transitions, as well as the many legal and regulatory opportunities it creates moving into the future. So uh, just a few, um, final few words before we I pass it over to our, our guest. So she'll uh, have uh, a lecture for us and then save your questions for the end because we'll have a, a question period where you guys can answer questions. Um, so thank you uh, again for our speaker for being here and to all the uh, audience for being here. So I pass the floor to Dr. Harrington. Thank you so much, Toby. And really, there was no need to read the whole biography. It's absolutely fine. It's very, you know, it's always sounds so much more, I don't know, serious than it really is. Um, so thank you, Toby. I don't know, I never see myself as just being that, uh, that serious of a person. But um, thank you all for joining today. And I do have to give a quick, uh, several shout outs, first of all, to to the whole team at the journal because um, this is a wonderful series and I'm very grateful for you keeping us all connected, um, especially those of us who have a very strong love in our hearts for McGill uh, to keep us all connected to you, to the work that you're doing and especially during the still somewhat limited pandemic um, travel abilities. Uh, just to be able to see you all today in some form is lovely, so thank you. Um, and especially to Juliette and also to Carla, I really appreciate their um, just tireless work in bringing this about today. And I have to give a special shout out to Lavinia, who I see is on uh, this call right now, and she's an LLM student, and she was a former student of mine um, at, at Ave Law School last year, in fact, um, or up until this year. So um, I am so glad to see her and familiar faces and also to meet the rest of you. And please, you know, ask questions um, at the end. I'm happy to take them, even if it's more about, you know, transitions or, uh, in your own careers and ideas of, um, you know, things that you want to do. Just because I'm talking about just transitions doesn't mean I'm you know, not available for other questions that you might have. Um, also, if you have questions about the upcoming um, conference of the parties for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Glasgow, um, which is coming up next month, please, um, you know, please don't hesitate because I will be there and actively participating as well. But the topic of my chat for today is uh, just transitions and specifically the concept of just transitions as paradigm for post-pandemic climate change laws and even beyond, and just how we can use this to shape um, the future of law and regulation, which as Toby pointed out is the book that I am currently trying desperately to finish because I just got a contract for another book, which means I kind of got to get this one out by January, but um, not in a rushed way at all. But um, it is a topic that I think is one we don't talk about that much, um, or we talk about in a very limited concept having to do with energy and having to do with especially coal. Um, but we don't talk about in its full potential and we can see its full potential as lawyers and as sort of those who create regulation when we come into the idea of how to build back from the pandemic, how to address climate change. And then as we think forward to whatever unknown but most likely will happen forms of um, you know, next challenges the international community faces. 
So rather than just hearing me talk, I did actually prepare um, a PowerPoint. So I will share the screen if that's all right, or if, I, if it's okay, I can send it to you, Emma, too, if that's better. Um, I think Juliet can give you co-host privileges so that you can share it yourself. I think it would be a little bit smoother that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, there, there's one thing I hate, it's asking people to move slides for me. <laughs> so like the, I just feel like an obnoxious human being, so I can do them myself, really. Anyway, so um, what I've tried to do, I, I apologize, I only found a couple of photos, but um, I tried to throw some photos in here as well. And I will admit that while well, we will talk about um, just transitions being kind of, created and born in the US. Um, the photos that I do have are uh, the only coal mine I have visited, which is in Silesia in Poland, but I figured it would give it a sense of where this was born and then what it can evolve into in the future. Um, but in the 1970s, so before any of us on this call were actually born, um, including myself, there was this idea of um, in many areas in the US, in Pennsylvania and in Appalachia, so West Virginia, um, and within the whole Appalachian mountain region, of taking the, um, the traditional coal industry, which had been in some cases generational. Um, families had been able to say that they were coal miners for years and years, um, and their, you know, their grandfathers, et cetera, had been doing this. And changing that dramatically by closing coal mines. Um, we often associate now the closing of a coal mine with the idea of an environmentally beneficial, helpful activity. At the time, this was actually more looked at from an, uh, an economics perspective. And in many of these areas, uh, the coal mines that were operating would have needed a great deal of rehabilitation or upgrades so the decision just to be economically viable and so the decision was made to relocate um, or to close the mines at the same time there was also a realization that there could be coal exploration in and exploitation in other areas of the world that would have somewhat less um, onerous labor obligations and in response to this effort by private industry to close the coal mines with very little notice and no, um, no assistance to miners, no assistance to their families or the community. This idea of just transitions was born from many labor unions and labor organizers in the US. And the idea was that both the government and private industry in these types of situations owed a duty to the workers, to their families, to their communities that have been built up around these mines. Um, to ensure that if they were going to close, they didn't just close overnight. Um, they weren't just given a slip that said, you know, you've been terminated, you've been made redundant, here's two weeks wages, um, find your own way. But rather that this was done in a way where the transition from one type of economic activity to another or from being a mining community to not being a mining community was done holistically so that we included education for minors, education for their families, um, alternate forms of economic activity for communities so that we didn't lose communities. And that we really realized that yes, this may have been a private undertaking, but it was much more than just a private undertaking. It was something that benefited um, all aspects of society and benefited the government as well by being able to provide electricity in this case to um, and power to a number of individuals throughout the country as well as to basically all of industry so that there was a duty of the government as well to step in and ensure that this happened and to provide more than uh, just a welfare check under the American welfare system or an unemployment check um, but rather to provide a means for people to move forward and actually have some type of um, societal value and economic value um, and be able to feed their families. This was um, reasonably well embraced in the US at that time. And it became much more of a rallying cry across the US that ultimately spread outwards. And it spread into Canada, it spread into England. Um, around the same time, there were many efforts to close mines in England, especially in the north of England and Scotland um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And we saw this idea really starting to take flight and take shape. Um, 
in a way that focused on economics and also society in the labor context and really in what we considered at the time to be a very limited space for coal and for very outdated industries. Um, at the beginning, there was a significant tension between, um, actually sometimes a physical tension, they were often actually physical altercations, between the labor sector and environmental activists or environmental concerns. Um, and there was a feeling amongst many in the labor sector and labor movement that environmentalists were at the cause or one of the root causes of um, closures because of insistence on higher standards, higher safety standards, higher environmental standards, which then gave rise to kind of making existing coal mines outdated um, and requiring so much money to be invested into them that they ultimately were not economically viable. However, over time, these ideas started to come together. And over time, there were actually bridges built between legal communities as well as also um, regulatory communities and societal groups that said we can actually um, you know, have a dialogue and that we can find common areas where labor and environment can bridge together and where we can use just transitions. And the idea of helping communities as they move forward from what they had been relying on economically um, as a matter of law, as well as economic policy. So this was a very pivotal moment. And this has now framed what many of you may have, if you've heard of really just transitions at all, what you may have started to think of it as, and that is as a means to shift an industry, especially an extractive or energy related industry away from uh, dirty and polluting activities like coal mining into something that's much more um, renewable based or into, for example, um, having those who are operating uh, coal mines, operating uh, wind farms instead, which is often one of the most common um, efforts at shifting over, which is fine, which is very good. And it, it really does show an evolution in law and society coming together. However, this is not indeed the only means of, of conceiving of this. And um, what we have seen is that as the international law community has tried to address climate change and has tried to address the root causes of climate change, as well as the potential impacts of both current and future impacts of climate change, the understanding of just transitions has become much more important. Um, as a little bit of background, because I, I wasn't sure what how many of you would have studied environmental uh, law at this point or, or international law at this point. So I do apologize if some of this is duplicative for some of you. Um, but the, the key climate change legal regime right now um, was created in 1992, and it is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change which we all, because of its very long name, will typically refer to as the UNFCCC. And the UNFCCC was created along with several other uh, conventions in 1992 to address environmental issues. But the way that it was created um, was different than we often think of in international law, where we think of a treaty or a convention being adopted to address a specific issue at a specific time based on the scientific knowledge and technical bits of knowledge that we have at the time. Um, instead, the, the framework element of the UNFCCC really has been used to allow this to be a much more progressive document. And the 1992 convention provides for a structure, a secretariat, which hosts the Conference of the Parties, um, which I alluded to earlier, uh, the Conference of the Parties 26 in Glasgow. It, um, it brings together all of the parties, all the member states to discuss updates and to have updates that need to happen occur on a yearly basis, almost yearly until COVID, but anyway. Um, and it sets a framework for what we need to regulate in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. It also creates the ability of the international community to establish further 
much more um, nuanced and advanced understandings of how to regulate climate change as we move on in time. And the first example of that was the Kyoto Protocol, which was adopted in 1997. Um, it, has largely terminated, technically it terminated in 2011, um, but there were some of its instruments that continued on for several more years, uh, several of its committees, the last of which is scheduled to have its last meeting this year in Glasgow, so hopefully that will be done. This was very technical. So the Kyoto Protocol established, for those of you familiar with um, the emissions trading system that's used in the, the European Union, established the framework for that established an internationally agreed upon way for a number of different um, climate related carbon trading or other types of uh, emissions trading systems to work and to function and gave basic legal cover for states that wanted to do this um, to avoid things like having conflicts with World Trade Organization or other uh, free trade agreement commitments. However, it was very much silent on social aspects, largely, other than on looking at um, various types of countries and classifying them in terms of their development status and their ultimate um, responsibilities for cutting emissions. There was not really much of a social discussion or determinant at that point. However, when we move on to 2015 um, and the Paris Agreement, we see that this has shifted dramatically. And the Paris Agreement was the successor to the Kyoto Protocol, but it went very much beyond what was in the Kyoto Protocol. By the time we had gotten to this point, we realized that uh, Kyoto served many purposes. It set up many important economic aspects of addressing climate change, but it didn't go far enough in terms of addressing the, the drivers of climate change or those who would be impacted by climate change, um, especially in the social areas where we look at social and economic impacts on vulnerable communities, so on indigenous communities, on women, on children, um, on those that are traditionally marginalized. And the Paris Agreement changed this by requiring states to take these populations into account, requiring the international community to address how this was uh, happening, what the impacts would be, how to mitigate against them, how to have adaptation measures for them. And included in this was the idea of using just transitions uh, to foster the shift to very climate responsive strategies and policies that would at the same time address issues of climate change, try to mitigate whatever types of harms had already been caused by climate change, um, and also ensure decent work for those who are involved in the new industries, as well as coming out of the older polluting industries. Decent work is a terminology that comes from the sustainable development goals, and I will touch upon them briefly in several slides, um, just to highlight some other considerations to take into account. But as a result of this, in 2015, um, the UN FCCC set up an oversight body system that um, looks at a number of different impacts of social and, uh, and economic aspects of concern on the environment. And just transitions and labor was certainly included in these and it uh, continues to be included in these discussions. When we advanced several years to 2018 in Katowice in Poland, what we see at, uh, at COP24 was the creation of the Declaration on Just Transition, um, which Katowice is in the Silesian region of Poland. It is the source of those photos in the beginning. Um, and is the idea of this declaration was very much tied to hosting the event in Katowice because it is an area that is trying to transition in a, an interesting political climate in Poland where it's not necessarily as supported at the national level, but in the regional level is very much supported to transition out of coal and into other types of resources and other types of energy and activity. Um, but there is still a very strong resistance culturally and societally to this idea. So the declaration stressed that the international community, so it needs to be more than just a national commitment, an international community commitment was necessary to recognize the inherent connections between labor and climate and energy 
particularly energy, and to address this moving forward. Um, the declaration then went into the rule book that came out of Katowice, and the rule book itself was intended to operationalize the Paris Agreement, because as, as future lawyers, uh, you all know that sometimes what is in the law is wonderful, and what is needed to put the law in practice is a set of rules and set of regulations, and certainly that is the case with the rule book. So the rule book really does define um, committee structures, functions, reporting, et cetera, that was provided for in Paris, but that didn't have um, a set of teeth at that point. So one of the things that came out of this was the idea of the Working Group on Just Transition and Decent Work, which had its first operational meeting uh, in Madrid in 2019 during COP24. It will meet this year. I'm very curious to see what it does, but it will certainly meet this year. And so this is really entrenched just transitions within the climate change sphere. And this is very important. And it is very important to note that um, just transitions is at the core of international regulation and legal systems now and moving forward uh, for climate change. That also means it will be at the core of national reporting re requirements under the Paris Agreement, which does require nationally determined contribution uh, reports every five years. And the first set has already been uh, submitted. The second set is starting to come in. We'll start to see trends coming out very soon, but we do know that by putting just transitions in this position, it will also have to become an element of national policy when we're dealing with climate change, which is excellent. Um, what we know from for Glasgow is that it will certainly be at a center uh, position. It will be very important for discussion of loss and damage, as well as mitigation and adaptation. But we also know that there are many areas beyond um, climate change where just transitions can have future and also current impacts on law and regulation. And the one I wanted to mention uh, before addressing the pandemic is obviously the SDGs, given the scope of the journal and given the fact that you are all probably very much immersed in them. Um, but just to highlight that just transitions, although it's not articulated in the SDGs per se, ties directly in with many of the terms and many of uh, both the, the goals and the targets um, that exist. And so you have the basic background here. I don't think I really need to get into it in terms of uh, what the SDGs are, except to note that the SDGs were adopted in September of 2015 and that the uh, Paris Agreement was officially adopted in December of 2015, which means that the SDGs came first and much of the language that we see, for example, when we look at SDG 8, uh, decent work and economic growth, much of that language in terms of decent work is reflected in the way that Just Transitions is conceived of in the climate change sphere. So we see this link here um, that is very strong. It is very durable. And we also understand that just transitions will impact a number of SDGs. In fact, I could give, I have given talks on just the SDGs and just transitions, um, and I, I don't want to do that here because I think that you can certainly use your imaginations in that list to note that most of the SDGs do have a certain connection. But sadly, we must talk about the pandemic because as uh, we are largely, many of us tired of it, we do need to talk about it. And so the pandemic, as we know, has, um, has caused a great deal of change in the way that many economic systems work and the way that many industries work and function. And in the post-pandemic world, um, to the extent that we are in it now, the ability to travel a bit more and the ability to perhaps move about more freely and going forward from here, we know that there will have to be shifts in a number of industries. And we know that this will mean a great deal of transition um, away from certain industries that had been often very much entrenched in various countries that we now know are not as stable as they had previously been assumed to be. So the examples that I've given, and they are with only a short number of, of examples, but include things like tourism and transportation, um, education, healthcare delivery, how we deliver healthcare, um, remote visits versus in, in office visits, et cetera. And also hospitality and hotels are things that have nothing to do with 
climate. They have nothing to do with coal and extractives. And yet they are all facing, um, especially in, in island states and in areas that were very much linked to tourism and hospitality, are all facing existential um, threats that will require transitions away from just being able to say, much of our economy is based on tourism. Much of our economy is based on having hotels, et cetera. And the very real potential exists for those transitions not happening in a just manner. Because the very real potential is to say, we don't want to be stung again. And so we are going to move away from tourism to, uh, to services or tourism to banking as some um, Caribbean islands have really indicated that they would like to do, which is economically fine and may make sense on paper, but without using the concept of just transitions will ultimately result in the number of people who are unable to work, who are left without skills for work, um, who legally have very little recourse and communities that have been built up around uh, resorts, around touristic activities, for example, that have then very little way of functioning and existing and continuing to pay tax bills and just maintain the basic infrastructure and governance structure that they have. Um, and this is true for many other areas and many other sectors where we know that we may have issues of um, education and especially in the university levels, faculty and staff who for years um, have been teaching or have been part of administrations are now not necessarily needed anymore because some functions can remain online post pandemic. But how do we retrain staff members who may be very close to retirement so that they can have some type of job and some type of function and be legally protected um, as well as societally continue to be valuable and personally continue to be valuable. So this really does offer us a very uh, powerful negative. It also offers a potentially very powerful positive to look at how we expand out the core of our understandings um, from just transitions as solely labor in the energy and climate change and uh, extractive context to something that is much bigger and something that allows us to use law as an extremely powerful tool to create um, new means of entrenching just transitions where we can protect societies in a different way. And um, Though I have not yet finished writing the book, there we go, the ultimate argument of the book will be that we can position just transitions um, in a way that becomes almost like what we now think of in the Canadian context and American context and many global contexts as an impact assessment or an environmental impact assessment. So as a tool that is very much important from the legal and regulatory perspective that must be used and a requirement that must be fulfilled before undertaking any new type of economic activity or development to ensure that whatever the new plan is will bring the current people on the ground, whether they are located in a geographical area or whether they're in an economic sector along with the project. And it might not necessarily be all working in a wind uh, farm as opposed to working in a coal mine, but it will ensure that there is some type of proper and with the choice of the individuals um, and the input of the individuals re retraining, reschooling, um, so that they can have a say in what they do and not just be told, okay, you used to operate a coal mine, now you will operate a power um, grid or you will now operate a, uh, a windmill as has been done in some of the earlier iterations of just transitions that failed where we saw people very much reacting against being told, this is your new job, you're just going to do this. Um, if we're able to do this, it really will be a very powerful tool for how we build on um, for climate change, how we build in the future some type of sustainable mechanism for current and future jobs and also for current and future responses to 
any type of crisis, any type of pandemic or other global crisis that comes up that causes a very quick shift in the way that economies work and societies work. So this is still, as I mentioned, a work in progress in the sense that it is uh, due into my publisher in January, but um, it is a topic that I do really like to, to talk about and engage with students on, and particularly engage with students, um, because it is something that is so new that really does allow growth opportunities and in just in your thinking and hopefully gives you a different way of, of thinking about law and the relationship between law and, uh, and society and sustainability. So I will stop talking now because I have been droning on for a very long time, um, but I am more than happy to take questions or comments or anything else. I will stop sharing the screen so that I can just see actual faces instead because that is always much better than a PowerPoint. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. Really interesting. So I wanna, yeah, we, we have some time to really um, delve more into discussions and questions. So anyone who has a question, feel free to uh, either message in the chat or just raise your hand. And if you can turn off your camera or turn on your camera maybe and ask it, that'd be nice too. But whatever you're comfortable with. And dogs and cats are always welcome to. I've had them jump in and out of class for so long during various pandemic classes that, you know, if a cat jumps in in the middle of your call, it's totally fine. Um, so I'm not seeing any, but- uh, Which is fine too. That don't be, to be don't fine. be shy guys. We, we, this is a wonderful opportunity to ask anything like Dr. Really? Harrington said, she can talk about law school or Anything else? Well, I guess, uh, okay, we have a question from Grace, who's raised her hand. If, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry, it yes. might be a bit loud. Um, thank you, Professor Hankton, for your presentation. Um, I have a question, it might be a bit broader general, but I was just on that regarding the last slide about how um, like the thesis of your book is how we can use law to entrench this idea of just transition so that laws can be more responsive rather than reactive. Um, I was just wondering if you had some examples of laws that like already kind of do this or some work that's being done, whether in the US or Canada, that's like working towards that. I'm um, sorry, a bit of a broad question, but I was uh, really drawn to that idea. No, absolutely. It's, it's such a great question. And um, and I love the background, by the way. I do. It's fantastic. Uh, I recognize various parts of the school at different times. Um, so I I think, unfortunately, the, you know, the best examples certainly don't come from the States. Um, many of them are actually coming from Canada, especially in the way that a number of different Canadian uh, provinces have started to look at environment and um, have started to incorporate aspects, maybe not necessarily by name, just transitions, but still very much implicating the same type of idea in terms of ensuring participation of communities, especially in British Columbia, ensuring that um, when you do have some type of carbon market, there is much broader regulation to, um, to make sure that we don't just have kind of hedge funds coming in and very um, kind of investment oriented entities coming in, but rather we have a much more meaningful um, discussion on how we have carbon trading. Um, and that happened largely with Ontario and Quebec when it, they have worked with um, some US states in a cross-border system to, um, to engage in various types of carbon trading. Um, we also see this a great deal coming out of the European Union with various aspects of the European Union Green Deal, um, which has overall has its detractors as well as its supporters. But what it really has um, been able to do quite well is to break down, again, it's more of a framework, and then to break down a series of topics like hydrogen and nitrogen and methane, um, as well as even building and housing. Um, 
as subcomponents of what it means to have a green economy and a green deal and regulate in those areas and regulate very much prospectively um, looking forward as to how do we build uh, actual buildings better? How do we design codes better? So I think in that way, um, we have seen a lot of examples where you can find responsiveness and you can find an understanding that you need to create a system of laws that will be flexible, but will also be very much um, kind of stringent in the requirement, the basic requirements that are there. Um, I had hoped that there might be a Canadian, um, at least climate change policy that would in law that would um, that would do this. Unfortunately, the one that was proposed last year uh, didn't, and so it was not passed ultimately. But we can hope. We can definitely hope. So I don't know if that's a really good answer to the question. Um, and if there's a follow up, obviously, please tell me. <laughs> And I, I see that there are a couple in the chat. Um, let's see, there's one, Celine, it looks like you're first. Um, so the enforceability of international law that I am asked that on a daily basis, my students ask me this all the time and I invariably never have like a wonderful answer for them. Um, so in the international context, the idea of emissions and um, and emissions reductions is a very easy one to embrace. And I think we saw a lot of countries embrace it at the end of 2019 when we had the, the COP in, uh, in Madrid. I remember sitting at an event and I spoke, it was like an hour and a half event and I spoke halfway through it. And by the time I was done with my speech and I looked at my phone, about 20 other countries had announced that they were going to try to do you know, carbon neutrality by 2050. It's very easy to say that you're going to do it. The enforceability is much harder. And um, what will be interesting is that the Paris Agreement set up a different type of enforcement mechanism. So there is a compliance mechanism which was made operational last year and has held several kind of informal meetings because it formally meets at the COP. So it couldn't happen until this year um, when it will next month. But the compliance committee's goal isn't to be punitive. Um, it also isn't to be very much um, kind of advisory in the sense that we often see advisory opinions issued by, um, by these types of compliance bodies and then that's it. The idea is to strike a middle ground and to strike a middle ground by having um, complaints brought to it. So if someone wants to complain about Canadian um, NDC terms and, or not meeting the requirements of the nationally determined contribution um, efforts that it had put forward in its plan, which was initially filed in 2016, that can be done. And when there is a complaint brought, rather than saying, yes, you have violated this particular agreement um, because of X, Y, and Z, you're very bad, don't do it again. What actually will be done and what the, the committee is charged to do is say, yes, this has been found to be a violation. Um, we recognize that other countries may find themselves similarly situated in the future. And so we recommend the following actions. And it's really intended to be a much more um, kind of holistic effort at ensuring enforceability by not making it either something like we've seen this week uh, with the Kenya, if those, those of you who've seen the case between Kenya and Somalia at the ICJ, which is on marine uh, boundaries, but where we've seen Kenya be very much dug in and say, no, you know, we feel like we've been ostracized. We feel like we've been left out of the process. So we are not going to comply with this. That's it. Um, the goal is to avoid that in, in the climate change context by saying that this is a much more collaborative effort and we're going to try to enforce through uh, collaboration and kind of mutual information sharing than by beating you over the head with a, a negative finding. We will see. We know that thus far it has been very difficult, honestly, to make international law able to enforce emissions regulations. Um, part of this is a sovereignty issue. Part of it is an economic issue, um, but it is very difficult. And it's something that we will have to deal with for a while, I would guess. Um, let's see, I see Laura and I see Emma. Emma, do you want to jump in? Do you want to have Laura first? 
Um, I can jump in. I just wanted to pass along a question that someone uh, messaged to me in the chat. Um, so she was wondering about the intersection of gender and the transition into clean energy and how that fits into the just transition framework. So, you know, in transitioning from, you know, more masculinized jobs in the energy sector, such as coal mine jobs, which are, you know, majority male into clean energy, are there more opportunities for women? Um, and, you know, is there skills training retired and what the buy-in is from men? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. And thank you, Emma, for sharing it. Um, because it is an area that those of us who work in just transitions actually think um, will be very powerful for gender and for gender balance. Um, typically, what we used to see in the coal mining communities was a pattern of um, masculine dominated industries, women staying home, raising children in a very traditional setting. Um, and when we break this model, there has been a lot of um, initial kind of hesitancy towards it. But then after that hesitancy, um, if there is proper skills training, and we certainly have seen many areas in the world where women are offered education and training in a number of fields relating to clean energy um, or anything else they would like to do, whether it be training to go to law school, whether it be training to go to medical school, but anything where once the opportunity to kind of break that traditional model and at least offer real incentives are is offered, then at that point, we're able to involve women much more. And there was a discussion at the, the real kind of transitioning of just transitions from the initial like 70s, 80s thought process into the 90s and beyond of where do we bring women in because they are so hidden in these communities. And at that point, a lot of feminist voices and feminist legal perspectives were able to come in and say, you need to give the housewives at home as much of a legal standing and a legal right to access training as someone who is actually working in a coal mine. Um, and when that has been done, it has been done with some very powerful impacts. And so we have seen women coming into renewables, coming into clean energy, um, often in aspects of the industry, which they couldn't have done before or would have had difficulty before uh, in terms of physically some of the, the requirements, but now it is much more technical, it is much more automated and women are able to have a higher capacity for certain types of um, energy generation than they would have before, both in terms of cultural bias and in terms of physical um, capacity. So it is very powerful and it is a very um, promising area for where we've been able to see gender being balanced um, in ways that it might not have otherwise been done. So thank you for that. Um, let's see. I see Laura. I think there was yeah a question from Laura. Yeah, Laura. Let's see. Oh, you're in the library. I remember the library. I used to love the library. Anyway, um, is there a legal way to enforce an accelerated implementation of just transitions? So. There absolutely could be. It would depend, I think, a great deal on um, the existing national law if we're talking at a national law level. Um, but certainly there at the international law level, there will be in terms of once we see in 2023, which scarily seemed like a long time ago, but now is just around the corner, um, the there will be a global stock take of what we learned from the nationally determined contributions coming into the Paris Agreement or out of the Paris Agreement. Um, when that is finished and re actually revealed to the world in 2023, that will come along with a set of suggestions and indicators for what we need to do to move forward to meet not only the, uh, the carbon trading thresholds, but also, or the carbon emissions thresholds, but also the other elements like just transitions in the Paris Agreement. So at that point, um, I think there may actually be a great deal of international space for accelerated implementation and accelerated requirements um, and certainly reporting requirements. Nationally, this could certainly be used as well and I would not be surprised if some of the building back better or equivalents in various countries uh, provisions do start to include the idea of just transitions. As we're seeing a number of the sectors like I had highlighted earlier, um, where 
people are so entrenched and uh, often so much of, of society has kind of been built up around those industries that um, when the realization happens that you can't have tourism the way that it, it was before because we now know what happens if something shuts everything down, there will be a demand for accelerated response. Um, so I think it is coming and we'll probably see it very soon. Um, right now, there is no mechanism that could just turn like that, but I think that there will be several coming up in the next few years. Um, and let's see. I see also Sophia regarding legal education and working towards environmental and social justice. Would you recommend pursuing higher studies after a JD or LLB? It does depend on what you want to do. And there are certainly a number of different pathways. Um, so I studied in the States and have a, a JD from the States and then um, practiced for a little bit, realized I did not enjoy litigation um, and then went back to get an LLM and ultimately the PhD. I do really recommend, especially for those of you who are doing the LLB track, who are um, using this as your first uh, kind of studies, your first university studies, I do recommend an LLM um, if it is feasible, because not only um, does it allow you to, you know, to learn more and really drill down in an area, it also gives you a very different perspective on law and on what you want from law and what you can do with law. Um, as a, a JD or an LLB student, you're trying to figure out everything. You're trying to learn everything. If you're at McGill, you're trying to figure out the, the complexities of two systems and you're learning. And this is the, the whole point of, of that type of study. When you are an LLM, you have that basis and your goal is really to explore much more the areas that are of interest to you and really dedicate a, a lot more focus and a lot more of yourself to what you want to do and to deciding, discovering what you want to do and how you can do it. Um, and so I think it's very valuable for that. It's also very valuable as networking and as um, the opportunity to intern and to work with different people in a different capacity, um, especially somewhere like Montreal, where we have international organizations and many NGOs, as well as government actors. So it is certainly something that I would give a lot of think, uh, thinking time to and a lot of thought to. Um, if you ever have questions, I'm more than happy to, you know, to have a chat when I want to kind of go through ideas. Um, but I really think that it is something um, that has a lot of long-term value for many people. And it's no longer um, just a, okay, I want you know, air and space, so I will do, which is wonderful, but I will do an LLM in air and space uh, because it needs to be so focused. It really can be a much more broad-based experience that still gives you a, a lot of different um, educational value. And let's see, Samira. Um, Again, the library is a good place to be. I'm, I'm glad that you're all in the library studying. I'm very happy for this. Um, let's see, the need to, to study the social dimension. Let's see. I just wanna make sure I can properly recap this. Um, how do you see the diffusion of high technologies in renewable energy while there are a lot of nations that are not capable of affording these technologies? Absolutely. And how can we justify the gap um, that this might cause. So this is, it, I'm very glad you brought this up. It is a critical thing that we not get kind of bogged down in, uh, in assuming that everyone can have the same type of renewables. And renewables and new energy or new energy sources mean different things in different contexts. Um, so we can't just assume that it will be something remarkably high tech. It may be something that is not that high tech, but that really is appropriate for the area. Um, so that I think is, is the first thing to look at because solar may be very easily accessible in a number of countries. It really is. Um, with more basic, we don't need extremely high tech wind turbines, et cetera. We do need some technology for the solar panels. Um, but there can also be ways of having, um, investments, um, 
agreements that would actually meet WTO requirements, but that would still allow for private companies to come in and help with financing in order to be able to use um, solar and train people to use solar. Um, and I know that even in areas um, right now in Central Asia, for example, there's a lot of focus on this where it had been traditionally considered something that was impossible um, because of just really low interest. Now there's a lot more interest. And once you have that interest, you're able to then get ministries involved who will work with lawyers to draft contracts and other means of, um, of sharing technology, getting technology in. It does come with a cost and that cost can be granting land rights, it can be granting um, economic interest. So it has to be done very carefully. But that is a really important point. And it's also a point that we've seen um, outside of the energy sector, we've seen with fishing in particular. So there's um, a question about sustainability, obviously of fishing and fishing activities. And um, there are a number of different countries throughout the world where the fishing fleet is needed for survival. Unfortunately, those are also areas where we tend to see overfishing and we tend to see places that are unable to start sustaining even basic yields anymore. Um, and the question is, how do we move away from that without taking people away from their traditional livelihoods? And um, even if those livelihoods may not last for more than five years, which is a very complicated uh, methodology. And that is unfortunately where we do have to start seeing a lot more of the outside funders. So we have seen things like uh, the World Bank and we have seen a number of different private lenders as well and regional banks come in and embrace the idea of a just transitions model to transition an entire community away from very outdated fishing, outdated fishing into um, new forms of economic activity that might um, still harness their location, but for different means of productivity. So it, it is a really potentially valuable tool to cut across a number of sectors. It just has to be designed properly. Thank you, Samira, that was a great question. Um, I, think, I think I had everybody in the chat. So any other questions from the audience? These are some really good questions. And they really are. Touched on some things I was wondering about too. Oh, so here's another one from Grace. Uh, Cap 26, yes. Yeah, so um, COP is going to be so much fun. I hope, okay, COP could be many things. COP could be fun, it could be um, chaotic, we will see. And so the one kind of damper I have to put on hopes for COP and I have to do this for myself too, is that right now it does look like the UK government has worked out a way to get at least the, the negotiators in, um, even from countries where the vaccination rates are not very high because there had been a great deal of concern that COP would only be a European and North American um, endeavor largely because we would not have people who were vaccinated uh, in time coming from their own national representation uh, course. It does look like that will be able to be done in part because the UK and the UN have managed to get some vaccines. Um, so we hope that that stays the way that it, it will be. Um, I would recommend following just transitions. I would recommend following loss uh, and damage. Um, so the worst selling mechanism and then the loss and damage um, provisions that come out of it are going to be critical and they will definitely be areas where there could be boiling over. There could be a lot of um, fallout, negative or positive. I do know that a number of countries, um, especially the developing countries, feel that in Madrid, they were not uh, properly heard on the issue of loss and damage. And that they are also the countries expected to feel the greatest impact from climate change, especially in the, the near future. And that they're not getting the support they need from the international community. Um, a number of them have said or had said at Madrid that they would start climate litigation efforts at kind of a, a multi-pronged, multinational approach if they hadn't really received anything that they felt they should have, and they didn't at Madrid. We did see right after Madrid um, the Agenda case coming out of Holland and then several other cases being filed, Friends of Ireland or Friends of Irish Environment, um, and also, which was successful, 
for the, the climate litigation perspective and several new filings as well. COVID obviously hit that and stopped that in a number of areas, especially in developing states. But I would watch that space very critically because if there isn't movement and if the LDCs, I think, don't feel that they are properly um, given legal assurances in the negotiation process and the, the outcomes, there will be a spate of new cases across the globe of climate litigation, often coming from um, LDCs and states where there is high vulnerability and filed in not only their own national courts, but in other courts from other jurisdictions, where, for example, Royal Dutch Shell or uh, BP or any large company that will be uh, considered to have been involved in some type of environmental uh, damage could be sued and could be sued potentially successfully. And we've certainly seen national courts in Europe be willing to do this. Um, so I would certainly watch that. I would also watch uh, the mitigation space because mitigation is going to be very crucial. It always has been, but it definitely will be now. We know from the IPCC reports that we're really at this hardly critical moment. Um, the sixth report that just came out really highlighted that. And at this point, we are at some of the last moments for mitigation to be legally or environmentally valuable before we really have to just shift to adaptation and before we've, we've gone too far down that road. So I would certainly watch that space too. Thanks, Grace, for that question. Um, yeah, any other questions? We still have some time here. Um, Oh, so from Laura. Yes, Laura. Uh, mm -hmm. I often hear the term climate change negotiations between countries. Do you know what the negotiations look like? Is there a bunch of representatives flown in from each country? They sit around a table. Kind of really simple. I was wondering that too, actually, how these. Wait, no, and this is out. great. Like, this is, this is why I want you to ask <laughs> questions because, you know, it's. It does, it sounds very, you know, whatever. It is a bunch of, by the end of the two weeks, very, very, very tired individuals sitting in a room, often very cranky with each other, who really just want to go home. Um, but <laughs> to get to that point, um, so you will see, like, the first couple of days of the Glasgow COP, you will see all of the leaders there, you'll see the presidents and you know, prime ministers and they'll all get photo ops and, and that's lovely. And then they will go away and they will go back home. And the people who are left there are typically like very high level, often civil servants or um, deputy ministers, but typically people who like, this is what they know. They know climate. Um, they preferably are people who have a legal background as well, but not all of them do. Um, but this is what they do and they know these issues. And so you will have sometimes a country that brings a delegation. We, most people don't just bring one person, they bring a delegation. One person will be an expert in mitigation, one in adaptation, et cetera, or a couple will be. And those people, whoever is up for adaptation that day, will go and sit in on a meeting. It is a formalized meeting, but remember that these are usually held in like conference centers. So it's not like the pretty UN building with the cushy chairs and everything. It's a conference center. Um, in Madrid, it was a conference center that was put together really like quickly, the conference space really quickly because we were supposed to be in Chile up until a month beforehand. And then there was a civil unrest in Chile. So we couldn't be there anymore and we had to go to Madrid. So it was like just a slap together space, which was lovely and the Spanish were very kind to host us. But at the same time, you know, it was not the glamorous like, you know, UN General Assembly chamber. Um, but you, they will sit there and it, there are draft negotiating tasks. So they actually should be out soon, um, but there will be a text released that is the negotiating text. And one of the jobs of the UN Framework Convention um, Secretariat in conjunction with the presidency, so this year, um, the UK, but wherever the meeting is technically being held, uh, one of their jobs is to sit down and come up with this negotiating text of what are we going to look at um, on the agenda for each COP. 
that then gets sent out to all the national delegations who pounce upon it. They look at it, they go, I like this, I hate this, you know, we can compromise on this and they come up with a plan. Sometimes it will change very quickly and they will come up with a plan on the plane. It's not always pretty, it really isn't. Everyone thinks it's pretty, it really isn't. Um, but what it is, is this idea of, um, you know, everyone kind of understanding what they're willing to be flexible on, what they're willing to give. And then it is conducted like a negotiation. Um, and it is often unglamorous. And I know people who have nearly, you know, come to verbal blows over whether or not to use a comma or a semicolon. And it's a combination of lawyers and experts at the same time. Um, so you're this, those things really do continue on out in life, Laura. They do, it's amazing. It's just very sad. Um, but you know, there will be rounds of negotiations. And sometimes if there's a point that there's just no traction on, they will move on to the next point and leave that for the next time. So certainly we saw a lot of stuff that didn't get resolved, especially with loss of damage in Madrid that is now held over for Glasgow. And it's entirely possible for everything to be held over or some things to be held over depending on what the will is. Um, when there is a sense of the presidency, because they get to chair all the meetings, that you can take a vote and people will actually be willing to agree and will actually you know, vote yay or nay one way or the other, then the vote will be taken. And if there is an, a, an approval, it doesn't have to be unanimous, but if there is a majority approval, um, then whatever the resolution is will pass um, in terms of loss and damage or mitigation or just transitions or anything. And then um, at that point, it becomes an official resolution that gets counted in part of the obligations for the Paris Agreement and for the states that sign on to it. Now, you can obviously, if you're a state and you don't agree with it, you can say, you know, we're accepting out, we're not going to be bound by this. That is your right um, as a state, which gets into a whole other host of issues. But um, it is a very not glamorous process. Um, I have friends who bring sleeping bags and if they're national negotiators, they will sleep at the conference venue rather than going back to the hotel if it's far away because the, the venue in, uh, in Madrid was really far away from where everyone was staying. So this one friend in particular just brought a sleeping bag and spent many an evening kind of curled up in a corner in a little sleeping bag. Um, and then, you know, it's a conference facility, so there were some showers and everything, so it was fine, but um, not recommended, but fine. Um, but it really is a lot of very pretty things out front and a lot of political leaders sounding off, but the work of, um, of the COP is done by really dedicated civil servants, as generally is for any governmental um, entity. Um, and it's, you know, this is something that some people just, that, that's what they do, they do all year. Um, they prep for this. And then we have a pandemic and then we don't do it for two years. And then we try to figure out what we do when we come back together. So we'll see. <laughs> so thank you, Laura. That was a super long answer, but anyway. <laughs> um, and I'm always happy to do mystify just about anything. It's, uh, it's what I'm well known for. Um, Lavinia, I knew you were going to ask me this. So on Friday, most of you I know know this, but uh, the UN uh, Human Rights Council accepted, passed the idea of the right to a healthy environment. Um, I think that this will do a great deal for just transitions. I think it will help to operationalize it more at the national level for countries that do start to um, undertake recognizing this right. And there are actually a number of countries that do have either soft law um, kind of preamble statements about the right to a healthy environment in their constitution or some in their, um, their various environmental acts. So I think that this will really start to operationalize it much more. Um, the voting patterns on that were really interesting, by the way, the, um, the votes were, there are 47 members of the council 43 in favor, four abstentions, including, I have to say, the US, which was very painful, but anyway. Um, but it did manage to get passed, and it's a really huge moment, and many people have been working for a very long time. So we will see what happens with it. And Sophie, who is also in the library, I, you know, it's, apparently it is the place to be. It always was when I was there. Um, 
So let's see, what is the role or power of law in changing public opinions about renewable energy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is such a hard area to have this discussion. Like Central Europe is such a hard area or Eastern Europe to have these discussions because it is such an entrenched part of identity. And often, you know, wars have literally been fought over control of those areas where we have these resources. And it's so embedded. Um, and that is where I think having international law instruments and um, kind of outside perspectives and outside requirements can be really valuable. Because for one, one perspective, if you are, you know, you're the outsider, you don't you consider you don't necessarily know what's going on, you don't necessarily know the way of life in, in whatever community. But at the same time, um, you don't bring, and this is really true for international law, you don't bring the entrenched kind of partisanship that's there um, on the ground. And so it's sometimes easier to use international law to break through those discussions. And actually to use like I when I consult with universities in the uh, in that region that are working on just transitions, I'm often brought in as the outside voice because I have no baggage, right? I mean, I do, I fly in when I can fly, I have lots of baggage, but I have no like emotional vested baggage and I have no previous um, relationship that can be viewed negatively or positively. And it's very true with international law as well, where we see it as much more neutral. And if there is now a requirement that all of Europe or all of the global community change and transition away from coal, um, or if it is strongly required in order to get other funding, um, for example, as it will be in many EU contexts soon, that is much more powerful. And in a way you can blame the outside actor, right? You can blame the EU, you can blame the international community, but still achieve the same thing. Um, and so sometimes it's all about like who you attribute things to and how you do it. Um, but you do have to really do it in a way that is at least respectful because no matter what you might believe about coal, no matter what you might believe about any form of extractive or any activity, um, and its utility. If you go into a discussion using international law or national law or anything else um, in a way that doesn't at least respect the other side's um, connection to it and the other viewpoint, then you've really already lost the discussion because people will start to become entrenched very quickly and they will not be able to get out of that role. Um, and I think that's a mistake that many people, especially people who are very passionate about environmental concerns often wind up making in having these types of discussions is that they, they don't see the other side, they see it as you know right, wrong, that's it. And not having that dialogue will really cut those discussions short. And because as you point out, the enforceability is a bit more questionable in international law than it is in national law, um, you really do have to create an environment where you can have a discussion and have laws that come out of that discussion rather than trying to just say, you're gonna do this now because it's bad for the planet, which we might all agree on. But if you're told, you know, if someone tells you you have to do something, you don't have a choice and what you're doing is just very bad, um, you tend to just react against it. Um, like every time someone tells me to drink less coffee. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, let's see. Oh, there is a hand. Juliet. Uh, we can't. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Um, I just removed my headphones. It's always the issue. Um, oh, so, always an issue. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, uh, you kind of touched briefly about, um, like just transition, just transitions, how it can be applied to um, kind of the changing labor fields because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just really interested in that because it's, it's something like, obviously the pandemic was kind of like <laughs> unpredictable and something that came very fast and out of nowhere, um, seemingly. Um, and I'm curious uh, how 
just transitions like the mechanisms um, that guide it could be enforced for these like unpredictable situations, just as like in general, future disasters. Um, if you imagine that there could be um, policies in place for like beforehand for if these if another pandemic or if um mm -hmm. like a natural disaster or some economic downturn could occur um that countries would um follow or be enforced to follow or if it's something you kind of mentioned that would just occur like that could just be enforced post disaster like as in like a risk assessment um yeah no it's a great question and you know, i think there are are both possibilities that could work um, in both ways. But I think the best way, certainly coming out of the pandemic, is to know and not to be a force of gloom, but speaking to many like health scientists, um, it is highly likely that we will have other pandemics, um, especially as we've seen more kind of interaction with um, humans and animal species that lead to zoonotic diseases, et cetera. Um, so I do think that we really can use this as a learning tool to say that when we have disaster planning in place, when we have emergency planning in place, um, and this type of emergency. So you know, emergency response for a hurricane is one thing. Emergency response for something that is much deeper like this um, is obviously something else and is something that I think we'll see a lot more work in general for. Um, having a, a system in place like an environmental impact assessment requirement that will tell us, you know, what may be the most vulnerable industries um, and often requiring the idea of requiring um, countries and regions to look at their economies and figure out what are our most vulnerable economies, what are our most vulnerable forms of, um, of support for society, and where do we need to focus on those to either shore them up or how do we diversify so that there is another, if there is another disaster, we can mitigate it better, um, I think would be very useful. And it's something that we could easily include in disaster planning, in legislation to pass it, um, in regulations that then would put it into place. We see it so much with um, planning for environmental damage and environmental issues coming forward that I think we do have many paradigms that already exist. It's just a question of, of knowing and articulating kind of what we would need to do and how we would need to do it. Um, and at the same time, I do think it's important to keep it open as an option for future as well in terms of post event, right? Because we may think that the impact of another, God forbid, pandemic would be X, Y, and Z on you know, a couple of different sectors. And it turns out to be something entirely different. So you do need some level of flexibility, but I think building it into the system certainly can't be that harmful um, and could prevent a lot of real damage um, societally as well as legally, because if we don't have a strong belief system in the laws that we've created coming out of the pandemic, when we already should use this as, um, as a wake-up call, and many people really do argue this and see this, then it will call into question a lot of legal responses moving forward too. It's an awesome question. Thank you. So we just have a few minutes if there's any small nagging questions people had before we say goodbye. Anything. And I, you know, I really do stay in touch. If you want to know what's going on in Glasgow or anything, let me know. Um, I'm on every form of social media, or you can ask Lavinia, she'll tell you how to find me because um she already knows and um and certainly the the editors have contact information um but it you know, it will be interesting um as a dual national i am lucky enough to be able to go to england without having a great deal of issues so i will certainly be there um and we'll try to be sending out as are much. you bringing your sleeping bag i yes i'm gonna <laughs> bring my sleeping bag and just sleep on the floor you know no <laughs> but although i do periodically nap in my own office here on a yoga mat, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> you know? um, it might be a little chilly in a Scottish theater or um, very large conference center in November, but yeah. Yeah, the Scots, they're not really known for their nice weather, so. No, <laughs> no, you know, wonderful, wonderful culture, fantastic Scotch, yes, but um, the, the warmth is not something I'm looking forward to. <laughs> okay.
Okay. Well, if there aren't any little final questions, um, we did, we just like to thank you, obviously, for your time and being so generous and even open to uh, future contacts with people. That's super, you know, inspiring to hear. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you so much, especially for those of you who are in the library and studying. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, and really, you know, anything you need or questions, just stay in touch, please. Um, and be well, take care of yourselves, all of you, you know. Winter's coming, get boots. Anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs>